Welcome everyone to this session on reducing the impact of pig and poultry feeds. My name is Jimmy Woodrow and I'm the Executive Director of Pasture for Life and I have a brilliant panel with me here. We have about 90 minutes, though I suspect we're going to barely scratch the surface of what is a labyrinthine topic. I'm going to introduce the speakers first and then briefly set the scene. This is a session that was originally in the farm practice room um, in the town hall that we uh, at Pasture for Life have co-curated with the Soil Association. So the goal today is really to highlight ways forward for farmers particularly who are interested in this area and not to get too deep into an NGO centered debate. And to help us do that, we've got four experienced practitioners who will be able to showcase what they're doing at a range of scales. First up, we'll hear from Nicola Renison, who farms chickens, pigs, sheep, and cattle in a regenerative system in Cumbria with her husband and two daughters. Nicola spent many years at AHDB and is well known to many of you as the founder of Carbon Calling, the annual conference also in Cumbria. Most of you will know her as Nick, but in this session, we will all need to refer to her as Nicola for reasons that will become apparent. Nick Francis farms at Paddock Farm in Oxfordshire with his brother, John, both first generation farmers. They have focused on Tamworth pigs and made a name for themselves among chefs and foodies for their pork, although they also farm chickens and cattle in their regenerative system, as well as producing vegetables from their market garden. Jacob Sykes and Nick Ball are behind Foss Meadows, a farm that produces free range, slow grown chickens all year round and they sell their products nationwide. The chickens are fed an additive free, ethically sourced diet, including now soy free options. And the chickens all have full access to wildflower pasture and hedgerows and roam freely. They are a great example of a slightly larger scale enterprise that is seeking to excel in these areas. And then finally, we'll hear from Josiah Meldrum, who by my calculations is the most in demand speaker at this conference. Josiah's business partner is also a Nick, so thankfully we have Josiah with us today. He's the co-founder of Hodmadods, a Suffolk company whose aim is to encourage us to grow and eat a wider range of pulses, grains, and seeds. What many people don't know is that the regenerative systems Hodmadods supports have a range of co-products that naturally support livestock in a circular nutrient cycling sense. Josiah will talk about this and the market for similar and sustainable livestock feeds in the UK. A bit of admin, please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, but don't hesitate to chat amongst yourselves in the chat box. I just can't guarantee we'll see any questions placed in there. Uh, and perhaps I should probably start by explaining why we at Pasture for Life are taking an interest in this area. And the simple reason really is that many of our members are running pigs and poultry within their mixed livestock systems. And in some cases, running these animals within their rotations, whether that's pigs within the wider herd or poultry following in mobile houses. We're also looking to respond to the growing use of the marketing terms pastured pork and pastured chicken, which I'm sure we've all seen in butcher's shops and online um, increasingly of late. And it's an area really that needs some much needed transparency and increasingly routes to market solutions for those producers and farmers going above and beyond. What I'm going to do first is to set the scene and to help explain why this area of pig and poultry feed is so important and perhaps overlooked on a relative basis. So I'm going to bombard you with some statistics uh, by sharing my screen. So hopefully you can all see that graph. Um, and this graph really kind of exemplifies the, the current situation with regard to pigs and poultry. So this is data taken from um, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which shows that since 1961, so a period of approximately 60 years, um, obviously livestock numbers have gone up quite dramatically, but when you drill down into the specific livestock types, it tells a very interesting story. And primarily that story is that while beef, um, beef cattle and um, sheep numbers have gone up by approximately 150%, pig and poultry numbers have gone up by a much, much bigger factor. So for pigs, it's 388%. This is global data, I should add. And for poultry, it's a staggering 1,323%. 
The figures to the right of that are UK figures, which tell obviously a different story to the global figures. So we're looking at 8% increase in sheep numbers in the UK, according to this data set, 2% increase in cattle numbers. And then for pigs and poultry, it's 33% for pigs and approximately 500% for poultry. So again, it's, it's still showing in the UK that the, the, the kind of predominant driver of livestock growth is actually coming from, well, primarily poultry, but also pigs. The final bit of data to the right and in the margin um, is actually data I've pulled from DEFRA. And this is for a much more recent period. So from 1996 for sheep and cattle, which show a 22% decline in agricultural livestock numbers. What this means is um, effectively farms that are of, of, of a commercial, commercial size, which um, is, is a slightly different um, standard for each different livestock type but it obviously excludes um, probably a, a long tail of, of livestock that, that, that are not on commercial holdings. For, pig, uh, for pigs in the UK, DEFRA show these numbers to have gone up by 8% in the last 10 years. The, the, these um, numbers are also taken from commercial holdings, which pro again probably excludes um, a bit, um, which, would, which might, might push that number up a little bit. And then finally for poultry, which again is where we see the greatest increase, the numbers have increased by 44% from between 1994 and 2020, and this is for production. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily the numbers on, on farm. It's, it's quite hard to get you know, true, truly comparable data. I also thought I'd then drill down into this excellent report, which Eating Better, the, the, um, the non-profit organization brought out a couple of years ago, which, which gives a little bit more color for what's happening in the UK and globally within chicken production. And I thought I'd just pull out a couple of, couple of points really. Um, and the first is that 95% of the UK's broiler production, as you can see at the top there, is, is coming from intensive indoor units. So, the numbers, the, 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 the massive growth that we have seen in UK poultry production is primarily intensive. And then also the fact that chicken now represents, and I think this is global data, 50% of all meat consumed. And that, and that, is, that is pretty staggering, particularly to people who grew up um, in the post-war period when chicken was a, a rare treat. The, fight, the, the, the second and final slide I thought I'd show you from this Eating Better report is, is very much focused on what we're going to be talking about today, which is what these animals are being fed. And again, what this shows is that chickens in the UK are fed predominantly on soy. So, and, 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 and within that, 60% of all soy imported into the UK is actually used by the, by the poultry industry. Um, and the emissions uh, footprint of of UK poultry is, is primarily 75% coming from the feed production. So the feed of this massive increase in, in poultry in the UK is of, is of paramount importance. Sorry, Jimmy, um, it's Ross, the volunteer. Are you able to make your script, your uh, slides um, in presenter mode? Everyone's seeing a, ah, okay. your, your view. Yeah. Be great to uh, swap displays. That's it, great, thank you. Is that better? Sorry about that. Um, this, this is taking it back to the, to the global scale, um, and again, looking specifically about soy, which is what a lot of this um, particular area is focused on, and the fact that global soy production has very much sought to, um, to kind of keep up with global livestock production. I mean, in, in some ways, those two, um, those two are completely interlinked. Um, much of the world's soy, as I'm sure you all know, comes from areas with um, ma major deforestation risk. And this is something which a lot of uh, commercial organizations and NGOs in, in the UK are now looking closely at to work out how we can do something about this. And then finally, I, I thought I'd highlight some important work already going on in this space before we move on to the, onto the practitioners. The charity feedback, so the top left of the screen, um, has done a lot of important work looking into the merits of feeding waste to pigs and have campaigned as well on this issue. It seems clear that changing this legislation will be a key element in promoting circular farming systems. 
and in particular restoring pigs to their long held role as nutrient cyclers. And I think it's fascinating this statistic that's here on the screen, which is that using food waste as animal feed saves nearly three times the emissions than it would by sending it to anaerobic digestion. On the top right, I thought I'd highlight for those farmers in the audience or anyone really with an interest that FarmEd, the Learning and Development Centre in the Cotswolds, are running a day's course on the 26th of January on setting up pastured poultry systems. So please do have a look at that if you're interested. Um, and then on the bottom left, um, I also want to kind of announce really that a small group of organisations have recently been successful in getting some funding from the Farming the Future funding group to look into this specific area. And this consortium includes Hodmodods, the LWA, PFLA, Sustain and Feedback. And in summary, the aim of, of this work is to develop the understanding of this issue specifically for a UK context and to develop better market mechanisms to deliver change. And for the PFLA particularly, this will include looking at those terms, pastured pork and pastured poultry from a certifi certification perspective. And then finally, I also thought I'd mention this initiative going on in Wales um, called Size of Wales, which is picking up on the fact that came out in a report recently that 40% of the size of Wales is used to grow key imported commodities, particularly in areas that are suffering from high levels of deforestation. And a campaign has formed around this issue involving the WWF and the RSPB. So if you're in Wales, please do have a look at that. I'm just going to stop my screen share. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Nicola Renison, who's going to describe her system in Cumbria. Thanks, Nicola. Right. Uh, well, thanks very much for um, inviting me here to speak today. Um, and I don't really like being called Nicola, but I will put up with it. Um, so I'm, I'm Nick Renison and I farm um, in Cumbria with my husband, Paul, and our two kids. Um, we came here in 2012. Um, I've done a few things, but I was brought up on a dairy farm and milk cows for a long time in a purely conventional way. Um, Renault isn't from a from a, a farming background, and he um, before we came here, he was a fell a, a manager on a fell farm. So um, we came here totally wanting to farm normally, like everyone else, and um, we we've got high borrowings, and then um, we we came across um these chaps and yeah they're all, they are all men they're, they're, they're the likes of nicole masters who, who's all should be up there really but it was really joel salatin that got us thinking about doing things differently um his, his book um pasture poultry um uh, was was our bible for a long time and then richard perkins um his book is always on our, our kitchen table uh, and and um latterly uh, greg judy who's actually going to be one of our speakers at carbon calling in june this year um so the these um we've watched lots of youtube and read lots of books and just realized that there was it was there was a different way of just rather than just farming sheep so this is what um the farm looks like today. So during the summer months, we have um, meat birds in chicken tractors. Um, we've got a couple of pigs and, and you don't need, meat, need many pigs to produce a lot of sausages and bacon. Uh, we've got a fledgling glamping um, enterprise, which is um, Russian personnel carriers. Um, nature plays a huge part in, in our farm now. And we've got areas that we just um, fence off and, and leave. Um, We've gone down from 1,200 sheep to just 200, which is uh, lovely. Um, and we've got a, a herd of um, 65 Aberdeen Angus um, sucklers. And we've also got the egg mobiles, which we'll be talking about today. And also we do now host quite a lot of um, visits and have lots of people coming here to see what we're doing. And we aren't doing anything, we don't feel we're doing anything particularly special, but it's always nice to share um, what we're doing. So I'm not going to talk about the pigs today, but the pigs are treated um, like the chickens. They're on, this, on a similar diet to our chickens. And um, you, it's very difficult to, to farm pigs without having giving them some feed. Um, but our pigs are, are outside for the majority of the time that we do try and get them eating as much grass as possible. 
So why pasture poultry? Well, um, we, all, we, we, we have to, out of necessity, do a lot of things on the shoestring. Um, so the initial, there's a, there's a very low initial investment for um, pasture poultry the way we do it. Um, it doesn't require much labour. It can just be added into the jobs of the day. Um, it's it's a, one of our stacked enterprises, so we didn't have to go out and purchase more land to um, to do it. And also, it's a very good um, if you if you have got a very small farm, it's it's an ideal opportunity to to get get an enterprise going. Um, the amazing thing that chickens actually eat grass. Um, they obviously need other stuff, but they do utilize the grass. And uh, poultry we just find it's, it's an integral part of our mixed farming system. So alongside the cattle, the sheep, the pigs, the, the chickens just work really well. Um, and we could start this enterprise small and just see how it went. And it, if it if it f fizzled out and didn't come to anything, it, it wasn't going to kind of bankrupt us. And also it's that realisation that um, just simple, simply if you treat animals well, feed them well, they produce amazing food that you can then sell and people want to come back for it. And it's that, it, it's the, that is the key point that we are producing a superfood. So this is, this is the low input cost. So this is an 18 foot um, caravan chassis. And this was when Renault started to build it. He, he went around lots of scrap yards, got, got, um, to know a lot of scrap men very well um and it was um it took a t it took time to build it was all done with richard perkins's book um and that's it well, it's not in the minute because it's in the shed because of avian flu but um that's what it looks like she's um she's not a beauty but um it it houses about um 300 hens and is pulled predominantly unless we've got going up a particularly steep patch by a quad bike you'll see there on on the photo that there's a, a wire fence around we did use a wire fence initially but now we, we don't use any um any fencing at all we, we just um they just go they they wander in the daytime and they go back at night so we move it every um every two days that the egg mobile has moved and they're generally um two or three days behind the cows so there's time for the larvae and the maggots to hatch um, and um, yeah it, it just works really really well so the pitfalls it's not all rosy um, avian flu has um, during avian flu times they have to go the egg mobile goes in a shed and then the chickens are out in the daytime in the shed and they go in the egg mobile at night um, it's obvious that they're thoroughly cheesed off in their current situation and um wh when you're dealing with truly truly free-range hens um being um held in a prison so to say does not go down very well um the the reason i put the environment agency there is because um with the meat birds um we currently have to go over to the northeast to get them processed um, and we would really like to put in a processing unit on the farm um, the Environment Agency don't seem to have rules for grey water um, for micro businesses, and it's just um, it's, it's a whole nother topic. But it's it's the realization that the whole um, the rules and regulations are designed for industrial farming, and there's a lack of understanding with, with small micro um, enterprises. And then feed, um, we're selling this very regenerative um, story that our um, uh, we're trying to do our utmost for the planet and then you think oh my word where am I going to get feed um, for these chickens so it's it's it, and it's it's just that you that's the lovely picture of the um of our fell and the chickens are just roaming around collecting the eggs but I, I think we we kind of um realize that um feeding importing well feeding soya for these chickens was was not going to be a story that um sat well with our customers so um and it's that it's it's a realization that you you are trying to go against the flow so it's it's making phone calls to feed merchants which i did a lot of and it's just asking that simple question uh, do you have a soya free chicken feed and it's like asking um 
oh, I was just asking you a very odd question. And and it, they um, sometimes it's a straight no. Sometimes they they um, silver coat it a little bit. But it's just it, it and it and it it, it, it it that's when you realise that the whole system is um, it, it's going the wrong way. But after um, many phone calls, we um, we found uh, a feed company relatively local to us um, that could supply us with um, soy and palm oil free feed. They would um, deliver a relatively small load at three and a half tons and the price was similar. So and the trouble with soya is it is such a good feed that that's that's the annoying thing it is an amazing feed so the main um how they've replaced the soya is with rape um sunflower and distillers um distillers grains but it's um and i think since they've um started doing our ration they have been able, been able to supply more more pig and poultry people with this soya free ration but is this good enough? And the answer is no. Um, it's it, it. Ideally, we'd like to be feeding. Um, we'd like to just buy local feed from a local farm and mill it ourselves. Um, we we aren't organic. Uh, uh, where we are, to, if we were organic, um, we wouldn't be able to sell the the the, the produce locally. Um, are there other options pulses insects i think it's we're just starting the journey and we're doing the best we can at this time so the costings um and and i are we are tiny so um and this is just obviously part of the business but this is just an example of our costs um so the eggmobile um cost around two thousand pound to to make um, but that's not actually in in these costings. I've, that, that's just what it costs, but it will depreciate over time. So um, our hens, um, you buy them at point of lay at nine pound. The feed, our feed costs are about, it's a bit higher at the moment because they're inside, but it's about 7p a day. Um, there is a cost with a quad bike, um, with egg boxes, with bedding for the winter. But you're still, and currently we sell eggs at 25p. Um, we are going to be putting them up shortly, but you'll still see a margin there um, of £10,000 or £15,000 at 30p um, an egg. And obviously you've got fuel and, and delivery cost in to take out of that um, bottom figure, but that's still, in comparison to say sheep farming, that's st still <laughs> a, a, a quite a good, good margin. And as far as scaling it goes, I think we'll maybe go up to 600 hens, but I don't think we'll go further, further than that. It's just part of the overall picture. So this is um, what you can see the cows over there in the, in, in the distance, and then the chickens are um, in the foreground following them. And then my thought is, could this be pasture chickens like this could this be the norm so could dairy farmers have chickens um following their cows around and could we reduce the number of highly polluting industrial chicken egg sheds that, that, that are in the country at the moment so um this is just a little picture of one of our egg customers so every week we have an egg club and we deliver um to people's like an egg subscription but our story and what we're about, and this is where um, the importance, I suppose, of being able to say we are soy free comes in. We're all about quality um, and and telling our story. We're not um, organic or we, 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 we're not accredited to anyone. It's just we're very much about selling our story and to, to local people. And and also that the, the, the beauty, well, the importance, I think, of of being very transparent about our food and and the health benefits it, it has in comparison to other food systems and community. So I, I'm, I would like to get um, more people on the farm. We're, we're having, hoping to have a, a veg, veg garden and just get more people um, on the farm and get the farm to be part of the community. So that's me done. Um, we are on Instagram and I've got, two, we've got two uh, Twitter accounts there. The bottom one is uh, Carbon Calling, which um, I urge you all to get to join but thank you very much thanks nick um i wonder if you could just quickly answer one question that came up which will take no time at all which was from angus and 
asking specifically what breed of laying chickens you use? Um, we've got Marin, a Marin hybrid, which does uh, very dark brown eggs, which I think is is quite a good um, USP. And we've just got normal brown chickens. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's quite good to have some one something in there that's a bit special. Thanks. OK, um, we've got a lot of questions in the Q&A already. Uh, we are going to park them until the end, because I think there's going to be lots of overlapping issues dealt with by the different speakers. So I'm going to quickly move on now to Nick Francis. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. I'm going to try and share my screen as well. Bear with me. Okay. Hopefully you can see. Yeah, that's all good. From where I'm sitting. Um, okay, so a uh, quick introduction to me and Paddock Farm. Um, so uh, Paddock Farm is a 200 acre farm on the Warwickshire, Oxfordshire border. Um, we're home to a 40 sow herd of Tamworth pigs, um, about 120 head of uh, grass fed beef cattle. Um, an egg laying enterprise, um, not dissimilar to uh, Nick Renaissance, um, and a no dig market garden. Um, we also have a butchery business which runs alongside our farm, um, giving us a route to market for all our produce, plus enabling us to link up with uh, other farms and suppliers. Um, I should have probably clicked that earlier, but that's uh, that should have been the slide uh, accompanying my chat. Um, so our butchery business uh, consists of a retail butcher shop in our local village um, and also a direct to restaurant supply, um, which we run from the same premises um, and deliver out to restaurants all around uh, the Cotswolds, Birmingham and uh, quite a lot into London. Um, we're lucky to link up with a lot of really great chefs, uh, supply around about 70 restaurants. Um, and we've got sort of a couple of dozen Michelin starred chefs amongst our customers. So we've got some really great high caliber customers buying our produce. Um, so uh, we set up Paddock Farm in 2008, uh, me along with my brother, John. Um, we're a fairly unusual farming partnership as we're not from a farming background. Um, we started out with pigs, which uh, were produced initially as a hobby. Um, but we have always approached it from very much a food angle. And we had quite a simple aim. We wanted to produce the ultimate pork, um, but we did want to do this in a manner that was sympathetic to the environment and paid respects to the animals and the carcasses. Um, and interestingly for us, when we started out, a lot of the chat around livestock production was about the moral case for eating meat, the welfare of the animal and utilizing uh, the whole animal through nose to tail approaches. Um, and this is what we were chatting to um, our custom customers about from day one. But, um, and still obviously this is all really important, but in the last 15 years, um, the climate crisis, the degradation of soil, the loss of biodiversity, these things have all quite rightly become the focus. Um, so as our farm grew, uh, we've always been really proud to produce some excellent quality um, pork. Um, but as we continued learning, we started questioning our impact on the environment and soils and the impact of outdoor pigs, bred, raised, finished outside all year round. Um, it can be a challenge and as anybody uh, that's ever had pigs on grass all year will know, it can get pretty muddy at times. And this was us one February when we really did come up against the mud. Um, and, and this was then brought into focus when we attended uh, a Sustainable Food Trust conference at Fur Farm in 2018. And we heard from Joel Salatin, Charles Massey, and many others, a lot of the same inspiration that Nick Renson's had. Um, and we left asking ourselves, how can we fit pigs into a regenerative farming system? And uh, trying to uh, work on those questions, we've uh, made quite a few changes. Um, over the past few years. So firstly, and perhaps slightly beyond the remit of this discussion, um, we brought more diversity onto the farm, um, as I'm sure many of the audience here will be familiar. Uh, raising cattle on pasture can just create such an amazing series of 
uh, mutual benefits, improving soils, benefiting nature and drawing down carbon. Um, and they provide us with a really useful service as part of our rotation. And then uh, this is our version of an Eggmobile, um, which, is a, which is on the Joel Salatin uh, blueprint, um, which we also have following the cattle and absolutely love. Um, we run quite a few farm tours for chefs and uh, you know, we do talk about reducing our impact on the environment, but really we are trying to take a more ambitious stance. Um, we don't wanna be minimizing our impact on the environment. We, we really want to be maximizing our impact, but as a force for good, we wanna be having a net positive impact on the soil, on nature and on the wider environment. So if I just talk about what we've done, as I mentioned, we brought in some diversity, firstly cattle and now also laying chickens into our system. Um, and this has been linked to a reduction in the pig herd. Um, so two years ago, we had an 80 sow herd and we've halved this to 40. Um, and on reflection, perhaps 80 sows is uh, slightly too many for the land we've got available. Um, and the reduction in numbers brought about a bit of flexibility in terms of the land area we've got, uh, the infrastructure and really importantly, um, headspace for us. Um, and for the first 10 years, we ran a pig grass rotation um, in a fairly conventional manner, um, whereby we put out pigs onto grass, we feed them, they end up rooting up the grass and we rotate them onto fresh pastures and let it all recover and reseed and uh, come back later. Um, we're now taking quite a different approach where we're trying for most of the year to keep all of our pigs above ground um, stocking them more lightly and moving them regularly. So we're running semi-permanent herbal lays, which we're grazing the pigs across. Um, I'll come back to porker management in a minute, but for sows, um, this is quite interesting. So anything that doesn't have a piglet on them, suckling, uh, we are um, borrowing mob grazing techniques and equipment that we use for our cattle. Uh, so for the entire grazing season, which this year was beginning of April to the end of October, uh, we're moving sows every two days across a herbal lay, uh, encouraging grazing, but not rooting behavior. Um, we found that um, pigs, like many animals, love sugar. So if we can keep green growing vegetative grass ahead of them, they love to eat it. And they do this in preference to rooting and damaging the pasture. So I've done a little diagram here so you can see uh, how the uh, set up the subdivision work. So uh, on my screen, I've got boxes of people's names over the arcs, but um, you can see uh, we've got, uh, so there's a, there's a semi-permanent perimeter fencing with, uh, and we run a lane system back to uh, our, our semi-permanent arc and drinker at the one end of the field. And we then subdivide that using Kiwi Tech electric fencing, which is commonly used for cattle. Um, we've got our pigs trained to single strand electric fencing now and everything other than the outside perimeter is Kiwi Tech temporary fencing. So uh, there's no permanent lane, there's no gates. Uh, we are just able each day to move the pigs, uh, sorry, each two days to move the pigs onto fresh paddocks. Um, and the really exciting thing about this, I can go on to the next slide, to let me. So the, the, the really exciting thing about this is despite being monogastric, uh, we found that the pigs are able to extract a really good amount of nutrition and gut fill from the pasture, which has allowed us to reduce the compound feed requirement of our sows from 2.25 kilo per sow per day down to one kilo per sow per day. So huge decrease. Um, we haven't yet touched on the impact of compound feed. I'll come back to that later but clearly it's preferable to take the pig to the feed rather than the, fig, the, the, rather than the feed to the pig. Um, and economically, this makes a lot of sense too. So it takes us roughly 30 minutes every two days to move the sows, uh, set up the following day's paddock and adjust the lane. Uh, we're running a group of 20 dry sows. So over that two day period, we're saving 50 kilos of feed, um, which equates to five and a half tons over the grazing season and that's saving us around about 1500 pounds. Um, clearly there's a bit of a labor implication, but we feel that uh, this easily offsets any, any labor cost. And 
I think it gets even more exciting because if we get it right, moving sows into the paddocks right when the pasture is around about a foot tall, but still vegetative, we're doing really great things to the soil, feeding it through that fantastic energy from the sun, captured by photosynthesis and sucking down carbon into the soil. So um, as work from Dr. Christine Jones has shown, who I'm a massive fan of, um, the quickest, most effective way to increase organic uh, soil organic matter and therefore carbon in your soils uh, is through the liquid carbon pathways. And these occur when plants are actively growing and photosynthesizing. So if we get the timings right, we can feed ourselves and the soil at the same time. Um, to help us hit the pasture at the right time, we did also run the cattle across the pig grazing area during, during the growing season, um, which stopped the grass getting too far ahead of us so that we could keep it green, growing and vegetative, which uh, is the key to one, getting the pigs to eat it, but two, benefiting the soils. Um, and these cattle were followed by our eggmobile all season, um, so the ground did also benefit from a pass of the chickens at the same time. Um, it's important to say for anyone thinking of trying this, uh, what we do find is uh, you've got to hit it at the right time because if the plants get too mature and then go to seed, the sugars aren't present in the leaves and the pigs are then more likely to dig and root. Um, pigs are super clever, so if they're not getting the sugars uh, in the leaves, then they do go looking for it and they dig up the plants to get access to the roots. Um, particularly challenging um, in the autumn time. Um, so we have been running some soil tests on the field to be mob grazing our sows across and uh, some of the changes uh, I think are pretty exciting. Um, this is ground that we've been on for the last eight years so it's already fairly high in organic matter um, at around nine percent but after just one year of treatment we increased organic matter from nine percent to eleven percent at a depth of 100 mil which according to the Farm Carbon Toolkit, amounts to a carbon sink of more than 200 tonnes of CO2 over the eight acre field, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, I think we do, also, we do that, I would say with a big caveat, we have to be really careful doing soil testing every year and drawing big conclusions from that because uh, things do fluctuate and we have to be a bit careful, but uh, really exciting message coming out of that, I think. Um, so that's the sows. The porkers have been a bit more of a work in progress. We run them as groups of 60 to 80 pigs, so it's much more of a challenge to make up a significant amount of their ration as standing forage. Um, we tried running them on a radial system, but it was really difficult to train the younger pigs to the um, electric fencing. So this year we've um, gone for a sort of midway point where we flip flop them from one side of their paddock to the other every 14 days. Um, obviously, we get minimal benefit from regrowth with just 14 days. But the main aim for us for this year was to run groups of pigs through their paddocks and off to the abattoir without leaving bare ground behind. And excluding the area directly outside the arcs, uh, we were able to do this with uh, sort of 80 pigs on 1.8 acre paddocks, which I think we're pretty happy with. There's plenty more to try, but it's a, it's a, it's a good start. Um, so. Something we haven't touched on, as I say, is, uh, is feed sources where it's not grazed. And I think there's loads more scope here, particularly for the growing pigs. But importantly, we have managed to source a soy free pig feed. And I think this is uh, with thanks to the pioneers like Nick Renson, who uh, were approaching the feed mills before I was. Um, but we are able to buy a soy free pig ration now, which uh, is great. and it's not from a niche mill, it's from a mill called GLW, which is a big mill, and so they're offering it fairly widely. Um, clearly, soy isn't the only input into a pig ration that could be of questionable, pro questionable provenance, but it's, it's the big one. Um, and in addition, we are progressing growing some of our protein for pig rations in collaboration with our neighbour, and I'd really love to have a look at feeding byproducts to pigs. Um, they are, of course, the ultimate animal for converting waste into nutritious food, but it can prevent some challenges. Um, and while some of these food sources can appear cheap, uh, the costs arrive getting them onto the farm, storing them and feeding them out. But all food for thought and could certainly well work, work well in tandem with our mob grazing model for during the growing season. Um, that's about um, the uh brings me to the end of my little uh chat 
Um, thank you for listening. I'll pass back to Jimmy. Thank you, Nick. That was brilliant. And particularly to hear you on pig straight after Nick on Nicola on, on poultry. Um, moving on then to Jacob, who farms at Foss Meadows, who's going to talk to us about a slightly larger scale operation. Um, and there's been a question in the Q&A about that too, which we'll come on to later. Um, so I'm Jacob um, from Foss Meadows. We're based up in Leicestershire and I run the business with um, my partner, Nicholas Ball. Um, I have no farming background as such. Um, and Nick is from a, a farming background. Um, and we've been, um, we met in London and our passion and love for food brought us to wanting to farm. And um, we decided that chickens, um, no one was doing a decent quality flavour some tasty chicken like they get like you get in France and so we took um our uh, we basically decided we wanted to do chickens and grow them really well um with little um uh little finance behind us and um, we thought it was we we could start small and and grow that so we are now producing around 2,000 chickens a week um which we sell locally um uh, to local butchers and restaurants also around the southeast and butchers of London and then we also do farmers markets in London I think currently it's about seven of them and we also sell online as well um, on the farm um, we've just um, set up our own processing facilities which um, has been running for the last couple of months um, and we have a butchery um, where we um, also um, and a kitchen where we can do added value products as well. Um, so our farming, we initially started um, farming 12 years ago or nearly 13 years ago on Nick's parents' farm. And about six years ago, we moved um, across um, 20 minutes down the road to a rental farm, a council farm, um, where we have a long tenancy and which is where we've kind of grown the business. Um, so we were all about wanting to produce quality meat and um, we worked out that that was basically the age. So our point of difference is growing chicken um, to a minimum 81 days. So a couple of weeks longer than organic and a good three to four weeks longer than the standard free range um, chicken. Um, and from that, we get a much better quality uh, meat, much denser um, and um, hopefully more nutritious. Um, part of us growing the bird longer. Um, so up to about, um, well, so we, our soy free journey started around, well, probably around four years ago, talking to the mills, a bit like the other, um, Nicola Renson said, trying to get somebody to give us a soy free diet was very difficult. And, um, eventually last year we managed to get our mill, which is local to us, also GLW, um, to, uh, make a soy free diet for us up to then um, up to that point we were had a soy diet but the amount of soy in the diet was less than what would be in normal rations due to the fact that we were growing the bird longer the bird didn't require as much protein um, the bird would develop um, at a slower pace so we introduced a soy free diet last year on a small batch of chickens um, and that went very well throughout the summer. And then we've um, expanded that into more of our chickens um, this year, but we haven't gone fully soy free as we wish to work through a whole season, all different seasons of growing chickens to see how that works. Um, because obviously farming chickens um, free range throughout the winter is very different to doing it in the summer. Um, so far, fingers crossed, it's, it's looking good. Um, and so hopefully, comes in March, we'll be going fully soy free. Um, what we found, um, the industry, um, we know have been doing some trials as well um, on the soy free diets. And from, from what I've read, they haven't been able to make it work. We believe this is down to the fact they are trying to grow the chicken too quickly. And, um, and we're able to do it on the basis that we are growing it um, a lot slower. The um, so issues we've found um, so far um, is, so the chicken 
the key to growing a, a meat bird, a, ch- a broiler chicken, it's the brooding stage for the first three, four weeks of getting that bird lovely and strong. Um, and then so it can go out to its outside shed and be um, able to um, survive outside. Um, and what we've found is the chicks on the soy free diet are coming out much smaller than they were previously. Um, and this is down to the fact that they've got 20% less protein in their diet than the soy ration. Um, but by the time they get outside, they're still strong enough. By the time we're going them another eight, six weeks after they've come out of the brooding shed, um, they've managed to catch, um, catch up and we're still getting the same finished weights, so i.e. around two kilos oven ready. So though it's a slower start, because we're growing them longer, the bird seems to be able to cope with that and um, we still get the, the same end result, but without the soy. soy. Um, what's in the feed? So um, there's field beans, rapeseed meal, sunflower seeds, um, naked oats. Naked oats with no husk and it's very digestible um, and also very good for its, the gut health. We've noticed, um, so because soy is so such a good protein is often too rich for the birds. And what we've noticed that we used to get quite a bit of gastroenteritis. Now, since we've got on the soy diet, um, we're getting a lot less of that. And we're putting that down to the, the fact that we're not wasting as much protein in, in their diet. Um, so, which is, is a positive. Um, so, So the, the future of, of soy free at Frost Meadows, um, we hopefully come March, we will be going completely soy free, um, and which will be which will be great. Um, we found the cost wise, um, it's a very similar price the cost of the feed. What I have yet to work out fully is um, the consumption, but from Roughly speaking, we don't believe the consumption is any more than this soy diet. So um, cost wise, it looks it looks very similar, but I've still got to do some more checking on that. Um, so other things which we're doing on the farm. So we've just introduced um, our slaughterhouse, which means previously um, we were having to transport the chickens over two hours away um, to have them processed each week. Um, so we are now processing those in house on a weekly basis, which is great um, and hopefully a lot better for, for the animal on a welfare basis, um, and which will also allow us to keep an eye on the quality as well of the finished products. Um, we're looking at doing a lot more planting. So at the moment, our system is we have mobile sheds and we move those mobile sheds um, after each batch. Um, and so they get fresh pasture each time. In winter, that is very difficult. So we started to bring them up to a main track, which we can farm off. And what we're now looking at is basically making the environment there much, much nicer, more interesting around the sheds. And we will then, we're trialing this year, some semi-fixed sheds, and we will rotate the birds out of the sheds into different paddocks um, each batch. So I even gonna reduce the amount of uh, movement of sheds in order to reduce the impact um, of vehicles and things on the land and compaction, and also uh, to help improve any water runoff and things. So um, we're moving to a semi-fixed, um, semi-fixed buildings. Um, and then the other key thing is because of the scale we're at, it's trying to simplify the farming and putting in auger systems and things um, to make life somewhat easier than it currently is. Um, so uh, that brings me to the end um, of what we're up to at Frost Meadows. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Jacob. Um, there was one question which came up a couple of times, which you should be able to quickly answer again. What, what breed are you using? And is it correct that you're finishing at 81 days? So we, we're using um, a Hubbard bird. We use three different strains of, um, of the Hubbard. So a Cully Yield, 757 and, and a 787. And the reason we use the three different strains is so we get finished weights, um, different finished weights of anything from a 1.6 all the way through to 
kind of 2.83 kilos um, all at the same age, which is the 81 days. Um, and that's our kind of point of difference is growing it to 81 days. Great, thank you, Jacob. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to you in the, in the Q&A at the end. Um, I'm finally going to hand over to Josiah, who's going to talk a bit more broadly about the, the, the feed market and in particular what Hodder Dogs are doing. Thanks, Josiah. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, can you all see me? Am I here? I hope so. Uh, so yeah, it might seem a bit odd that Hodmadod is here. We are a business that sells British grown um, pulses and grains and, and other crops. And we've, we've worked over the last 10 years now to increase the consumption of UK grown uh, vegetable proteins. Um, and we've done that by creating routes to market, by working with a group of farmers in order to encourage them to produce those crops, and by looking at ways in which we can cr create more resilient, diverse rotations on farm. Um, and so I'm not going to speak directly to, to livestock production because I don't really know an awful lot about it, to be completely honest. But I am going to talk about how livestock production fits into many of the farms that we work with. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we as Hodmadod are looking to address um, some of the issues around feed. And we're doing some of that with uh, the Pasture Fed Livestock Association and uh, Landworks Alliance and others through the, um, through the funded projects that Jimmy spoke about at the beginning. So Hodmadod's origins really go right back to uh, the mid 2000s, 2005, six and some project work that East Anglia Foodling, which is an NGO, was doing um, with uh, producers and farmers in Norfolk. And we'd been contracted to, to work out a, a way of having a kind of a, you know, like a quality mark for food products and craft products, which was to be called produced in Norfolk. And one of the things that, one of the products that immediately came forward was, was pork products, sausages, cured meats, and, um, and there are some fantastic, um, uh, foods being produced in Norfolk. But when we began to investigate it more uh, in more detail, we realized that because those uh, pigs were almost exclusively, albeit outdoor reared, almost exclusively fed on imported soya and soya and, and byproducts thereof, that effectively there were Amazonian pigs that just happened to be standing in Norfolk. And that the impact of the, of the feed supply chain and uh, the impact on the origin uh, of those crops, whether it be North America, China, or South America, was absolutely immense. Uh, and that, the, that the, the ghost hectares, the feed footprint associated with pork and poultry, in particular production in the UK, is an area of soya production overseas around the size of Yorkshire. That was at the time we were doing the project, so it's probably slightly larger than that now. And that in many of the areas where those, where those soya monocultures are being planted, um, you know, they're incredibly biodiverse and there's a huge, I mean, we know all of this, we, we know all this so well, and yet it's still so hidden from us when we, when we go to the supermarket or when we buy meat products in restaurants uh, and elsewhere. But, you know, the, the Cerrado in, in, in South America, you know, it's a savanna grassland that contains 5% of global species, 5% of everything, and many of those are endemic, they're not found anywhere else, and uh, that this, this, this kind of production of a commodity crop for export is having a huge impact on those ecosystems. But the thing that we discovered as we as we kind of investigated this further, and the thing that is really interesting is, is the codependency of feed systems and the feed supply network and human consumption food. So for, for, for maize and soya, which are two of the largest uh, globally traded uh, feed products, and although 75, 60 to 75% of that production globally goes into animal feed, it masks uh, a connection with human consumption food in that, and, and in particular with really highly processed industrially produced food. So vegetable oils from soya, so most soya is pressed uh, prior to going to animal feed, and it's the meal that is fed and the vegetable oil is used in in food products and, and maize is the same. Maize starch is produced and, and uh, high fructose corn syrup is produced from that starch. And that whole industry is kind of 
predetermined on maize production subsidized in the US in order to produce animal feeds. So there's this really interesting codependency. And when we started Hogmadod, we wanted to move away from that. We wanted to move away from, from farming systems that used uh, bought in inputs for all sorts of reasons and to look more carefully at, at closed loop systems. And one of the things that we found um, was that even, even when we're producing UK pulses, um, there is a lot of what you might broadly call waste. I'm going to show you, I've got some props here to show you. So this is soya. I'm sure everyone knows what, what soya looks like, but it is a miracle crop. It's, it's high in oil, it's high in protein. It has none of the, what you might broadly call anti-nutritionals that come with uh, many of the protein crops that could be grown in the UK, like fava beans. So these are, you know, field beans, tick beans, and I don't know how clearly you can see them, but you can see that they're, they're quite dark in color and that's because they're quite old. And the reason that they've darkened in color is that the tannins are oxidizing and those tannins do have quite significant implications for particularly for weight gain in, um, in livestock. And so they tend to be an unpopular feed or they tend to be mixed or heat treated uh, with other products, which makes them more expensive weight for weight of protein than soya. Um, and, um, and then there are peas, which, which we sell a lot of. Now, the interesting thing about peas is that there are, there are three points at which peas generate waste. One of them is immediately after harvest. Uh, and, and fairly obviously, most of the farmers that we work with will be screening their peas and removing split peas, which just fall out immediately post harvest, uh, stones, uh, some damaged peas. And we would encourage farmers always to leave those on farm in order to um, use them for animal feed or compost them themselves or make some, some use of them. We certainly don't want to be moving them for further processing. But when we do move the peas for further processing, and we're just, just at this very minute actually, in fact, last night, uh, 80 tons of organic peas, green peas were processed and most of those would have been split. And when you split peas, uh, there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of, of byproduct or co-product. And I've got some here, which I, which you can see, and you can see that there's a sort of very dusty, flowery. Josiah, can you can you hold them up a little bit higher because you're not quite. Yeah, can you see that? I can't see myself, so I don't know quite what you a little, can see. A, a little bit higher. Yeah, yeah. is that better? Lovely, perfect. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is the byproduct that comes off that, and it's it's a mixture of the abraded peas. So there's a kind of a floweriness, but also the tester, the seed coat. And then obviously what we're interested in is, is what comes out at the end, which is the split P. Um, and that byproduct is essentially, is essentially waste. And there are a number of routes which it could go down. It could be sent into anaerobic digestion, which as Jimmy outlined at the beginning, is a very wasteful use of something that is still nutritious um, and that is used resources and land area to be produced. And in terms of the, of the 80 tons of green peas that we're having split, we could have about 25 tons of this byproduct. It's not insignificant. And as you can imagine, if you had larger uh, businesses doing similar things, there would be quite significant amounts of this byproduct being produced. And um, so we could put it into AD, we could compost it and return it to the land. And that's, that's another option. But again, it's quite a low value option in terms of nutrient cycling and, and energy efficiencies. We could use it for human consumption and that would be ideal except the issue with with this byproduct is that it's very very uneven and it's very difficult to handle so this is a particularly flowery batch sometimes it's much coarser and because there are quite significant volumes we need to find customers that want to make a particular product a consistent product that's very difficult to do so the final option is animal feed uh, and the animal feeds uh, price for a product like that is is relatively strong and we sell all of the byproducts that comes out of our pea splitting and bean splitting to an organic egg producer in Suffolk uh, that's Maple Farm Mike Mallet at Maple Farm and he doesn't feed it directly to the chickens he puts it into a um, black soldier fall uh, unit that he's got on the farm and they turn it then into a protein that the chickens will eat. Chickens are outside in an agroforestry system. They're moved around very much as the other chicken producers here have described. Uh, and they are largely pastured, but they do need a degree of supplementary feeding. 
and the uh, the pea waste and the bean waste is a is a is a fantastic product for them. We see that as a really useful way of generating some extra value. It means that the the organic split peas that we produce as a consequence will be a slightly lower price because uh, they're being cross subsidised by the feed sale value, and and it means we've got a a degree of a of a closed loop. And I think. One of the things that's really interesting in the work that we've been doing around the consumption of UK protein crops is just how much we could be producing in the UK. So on a sort of back of an envelope calculation, rotationally speaking, about 20% of arable land could be put into, um, into pulse production. Um, a lot of that land probably isn't ideal or suitable, but as a rule, you could roughly do that. At the moment, it's somewhere around 2%. And um, we need to be eating a lot more of that plant protein, uh, but there will always be this co-product. And if we could substitute that co-product that's coming out of UK production uh, for imported soya products, then we'd massively reduce our impact globally um, and I think it would it would provide a much greater connection for people locally with where their feed has come from. This anonymized the anonymized nature of global supply chains, the connection between those supply chains for animal feed with industrial commodity food production and all the health implications that, that have are incredibly negative. Um, so I think there's a really exciting opportunity for businesses like ours uh, and others to kind of engage very directly with communities of farmers and food producers to see uh, a, a sort of a holistic um, agroecological kind of system developing. And we might think bioregionally about that. We might think in our part of East Anglia, thinking with, you know, thinking beyond the boundary of the farm. Some farms are well placed to produce um, pulses uh, and other, other crops that might well produce byproducts if you go into animal feed. And some farms are much better produced. They've got grazing, they're much better placed to be producing uh, eggs or, or meat products or milk. And if we could find ways to collaborate locally to develop these, uh, these kind of uh, bioregional feed systems for a, you know, effectively a, a feed version of Hodmodod. So what we're doing with our collaborative group of farmers could well be happening with feed. Um, and moving that around and understanding what the requirements are, uh, both nutritionally and in terms of volume, uh, and looking at completely new ways of kind of breaking out of the commodity animal feed um, sector. So I'm really hoping that the work that we can do through the, the small uh, funded project that we're doing with uh, PLFA and Land Workers Alliance and Sustain and others will allow us to explore some of those possibilities to inspire farmers to think uh, a lot more about exactly where their protein fraction is coming from and what the alternatives might be, to look at some of the barriers and challenges in terms of uh, nutritional potential and weight gain and so on. Um, but also to think about how we might, might collaborate more actively um, with each other as, as farmers and food businesses in a, in, a, in a more sort of socially just, equitable, globally uh, system of livestock production. Um, I think it's really exciting. And I think it's something that's, um, you know, because of the capture by the likes of Cargill and others, it's, it's very hard to break out of. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have shortly and, and hearing a bit more about other people's thoughts about the possibility and potential to make this happen. Thanks, Jimmy. That's that's pretty much me for the time being. Thanks, Josiah. That was that was really fascinating, and I'm sure we're going to get lots of um, questions specifically about some of that. I must say, I think you've got a future on Saturday Kitchen, or perhaps even Blue Peter, with your background and your uh, interactive um, talk. Um, I am going to try and get through the large numbers of questions we've now got if all the panelists could possibly um, reveal themselves um, I'm going to try and synthesize some of these questions um, and give them to the right people on the panel the first one I wanted to bring up which is which kind of relates to a number of things that the panelists have talked about and a number of the questions that have come in um, which I guess you could boil down to scalability um, but it relates to perhaps something that Jacob mentioned around the fact that soy is basically needed to grow chickens quickly. And actually, if your primary goal is to grow a chicken quickly, 
quickly, you're going to struggle. And that, that obviously is a, is a barrier to scaling these systems. Um, Josiah mentioned this in, in regard to the kind of direction that he's trying to go in towards closed loop systems, codependency of different sorts of farming enterprises. And so I suppose the question here is, should we allow the tail to continue wagging the dog? Do we want to um, prop up this system, which as you saw in the first slide that I put up, has seen a massive growth in livestock numbers, particularly poultry, over the last 60 years? Or actually, is there a way that, that I guess Josiah was getting to, and I might go to, back, straight back to Josiah first on this, is, is there a way to take this slightly unconventional system and give it some scale without losing the the kind of intrinsic nature of what we're what we're all about. Josiah, perhaps you go first, and then and then we'll move around. Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental problem, and it is the is the issue that Hobbledod was was established to address, is that we need to eat less meat, um, and we need to be a lot more choosy about where that meat has come from and how it's being produced. And that's a really really difficult broad structural kind of issue. We've become very, very used to that cheap chicken that costs 250 in the supermarket or, or you know, a pair of chickens for a fiver. And, and um, I, think, I think that is a cultural shift, a dietary change. And from our perspective, certainly, we will just continue to work outside of that system and continue to forge and demonstrate uh, an example of sort of positive best practice. I don't think there's any, there's no way we're going to change Y Valley um, production and Cargill's investment in, in those chicken sheds. That's going to be incredibly difficult. That's going to take um, policy and, and a much bigger stick than we can offer. Um, Jacob, you, you're obviously operating to a slightly bigger scale. Have you, have you kind of cracked any of these issues and have you got answers to this question? Um, well, I don't think there's any. The answer is free choice and people's choice of what they want to do. I mean, as has just been said, you're not going to ch ch uh, change uh, the investments people put in on Cargill's, but way we are farming, um, you don't need to eat as much as meat. It is about quality, not quantity. You don't need to eat as much meat to be fulfilled. Um, the meat is much denser. You can, it's about education on going back to pre pre-industrialization of farming and using the whole bird, nose to tail, um, eating. Um, you know, I will eat vegan products and I'm not certainly no way near a vegan, but their products are good. And it's about basic education and whether people have got free choice of what they want to eat. But there is the options out there for people to um, not have their £2.50 chicken um, and still eat, um, eat well. And that's one of the bigger, bigger issues um, that we are faced is, is the quality of food that people are eating um, and people's health. But that goes down a whole other, another line. Um, Nick, any, any thoughts on this kind of issue of scalability and how we, how we ensure that there's um, enough of the right stuff to go around? Is that me, Nick? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so just on scalability of, of our system, and I've spoken quite a bit specifically about our dry sound management, um, we uh, employ a, quite a commercial uh, pig vet who comes around every six months and does sort of a proactive herd health plan with us. And he's a really good insight for us into the really commercial side of the pig industry. And uh, as I mentioned, we're running groups of 20 dry sows. And so we were asking Richard what commercially would be normal. And he said, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30. And so this, in, in that sense, our dry cell system is entirely scalable. You just multiply it many times. So, and that's what the bigger farms do. Clearly they just have 20 dry cells, they might have 200. But there's no reason why you can't have 10 paddocks of 20 cells, which are um, utilizing an awful lot of uh, for grazed forage. Um, I'd also, I also think that we don't, you know, uh, I know you know this, and it's something that, that Nick touched on in her thing, we don't all want to be chasing scale and going bigger and bigger. If you can stack enterprises and if you can have diversity in your, in your system and in, in, be producing nutritious food and, and in harmony with the environment, then that's where we should be 
aiming rather than for scaling. But I do also understand there's a wider conversation about feeding the world. Thanks. And uh, finally, Nicola. I, I think it's just a very honest conversation about the true cost of food. And I think as someone said in the chat about the, the huge amount of chicken sheds that are in the Hereford Shropshire area and the pollution that causes. So that £2.50 chicken is actually a very expensive chicken if you look at a bigger scale. I mean, you can't buy a latte for £2.50. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just not, it's not realistic to, for people to... Ex they, they need to know the life that chicken has and, and spend a bit of time in those sheds. And, and that sounds quite controversial, but I think it's, um, there's a cost to that £2.50 chicken. Um, there's I, totally there's agree. I got yeah. really annoyed when I uh, went to the supermarket last week and I, I saw, and I don't go to the supermarket that often, and uh, I got into a lot of trouble for commenting too much to my partner. But uh, I was so racked off with all this beautifully presented uh, meat. And it's just so dishonest. The pictures on the front, the packaging, like all this lovely expensive packaging. But the, the bulk of the people that are buying that chicken, they don't understand what what it is or what's around it or how it's been raised or the, the hidden costs to that production. There's been a related question or a related series of questions um, on, on insect protein, um, which I must admit is, out, is outside of my knowledge base, but I don't know if any of the panelists have considered, or particularly any of the farming panelists have considered using in, insect protein as part of their system in, in 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 one form or another and i suppose josiah is it is it an area that you've looked at at all even you know indirectly it's only indirectly through our engagement with maple farm and, and seeing what mike has been doing it, it's meant that where previously he was quite particular about the pea screenings he took they were almost good enough for human consumption because of needing to go through his mill and mix machine on the farm in order to make up a ration, to being able to take almost anything, including the very powdery screenings that I waved around earlier. And, um, and because, because the, the larvae can convert all of those into protein very, very effectively. And what's interesting is I think, I think he was saying that for every two kilos of larvae that are produced, there's one kilo of frass of, of, of byproduct from the insects, which he can then put onto the horticultural part of the farm. And it's a really good soil improver and it's very nutritious. Any other thoughts on this particular topic from the others? So I think what's, what's been said in going back to in the old days of farming, they used to be mixed, mixed farms. It wasn't all just a chicken shed cows and another farmers doing pigs they were often mixed enterprises and that's one of the issues people like us i guess are, are doing more mixed enterprises and that's kind of the way forward with farming if we want to be able to um utilize these byproducts um for better sustainability um rather than these big super farms where they're they've been knocking down you know enormous fields for arable and things there needs to be more kind of joined up thinking and smaller scale farms. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I'm going to move, assuming that uh, Nick and Nicola don't have anything to say on, on insect protein, I'm going to move on to uh, a number of questions that came in on the importance and perhaps the practicality of on-farm processing. Jacob, I know it's something, and perhaps I'll go to you first, it's something you mentioned that you do now um i suppose what have there been any kind of key lessons you've taken from what that's done to your business and perhaps what other people should be looking at in terms of getting into it so on farm processing so we've been wanting to do it for years it's on the scale that we're at um it's an enormous it's approaching a million pounds to set up um but it's something we felt was really important for us on the basis that we could keep the control of our end product, but also for the welfare of the animal. Um, and we were sending it away up to, up to um, Cheshire every week, and they did a great job for us. But the costs involved in transporting it there, transporting it back, the cost of the processing just didn't add up. So now we are processing on the farm since, uh, since October last year. 
Um, and uh, there's a, where it's like a whole new business, which we're having to learn and employ for. Um, and, but it's going to be very good um, longer term for us. And it means we'll be able to use much more of the animal um, than we've been able to use up to now. And the, um, the welfare of the animal, it's coming straight off the field, 50 meters away in, into the back of the, um, the processing facility. Um, and so hopefully it's a much better, better journey for the, for the animal. Um, Nick, Nick Francis, I assume you're not planning on um, processing your, or slaughtering your pigs on farm, but it is, is this an area that you've looked into at all? And particularly, you know, do you have any challenges with slaughtering your pigs? Because I know there've been lots of abattoir issues more broadly. Has, has, has that been an, uh, a barrier for you? Uh, we've, we're really lucky that we still have a very small abattoir uh, that's five miles from us that we take all our animals to and uh, we've got a really good relationship with them and they do a fantastic job. We're so lucky and long may that continue. But um, uh, the, there, there, there has been uh, an initiative, as you'll know, um, launched uh, to establish a mobile abattoir. Um, which we have looked into because it's relatively local to us at Fur Farm in Gloucestershire. Um, and they've got a fully uh, portable abattoir that can drive to farm and uh, process uh, cattle, uh, pigs and sheep. And it's a pretty exciting prospect um, that we could be able to uh, do that, that part of the processing on farm. As you know, we already process all our animals, we just don't kill them currently. Um, I am though conflicted because uh, we have a really great abattoir on our doorstep and would really like to support that business and uh, would hate to see it go. So uh, for the time being, uh, we will certainly continue to support them wherever we can. Nicola, any thoughts on, on the kind of slaughtering processing? Yeah, well, we just looked at doing it on a very small scale. I mean, tiny in comparison and very much along the Richard Perkins line. And um, so maybe during, because we only have meat chickens during the, the growing months. So maybe, I don't know, 300 a week. Um, but the permits that we were going to need to tick a box for grey water from the Environment Agency were just incredible. And the, I talk, spoke to the very top man at the Environment Agency and he said that I needed to challenge them because their rules and regulations were not fit for purpose. But that challenge takes a huge amount of energy and I haven't quite mustered it yet. Um, but um, there is a huge demand for our chicken, but um, it's a little bit, you, you've just got to be prepared to jump through a lot of hoops. And, and at the minute, I haven't got the energy, <laughs> but it's something we'll probably have to do. Thank you. Um, there, there have been a couple of questions from Alison and Amber on how do we, how do we create change? And I know, Josiah, you, you, you kind of started talking about this, particularly thinking kind of bioregionally. Um, perhaps going to you first, what are the what are the kind of key barriers and steps in in this process do you think in order to get certainly more people farming this way and perhaps in your kind of world more people producing the right sorts of feed at the right sorts of scale yeah i mean i think it's quite interesting because we we did start off in a as as, as a non-governmental organization and that was deeply frustrating we could go to farms and tell farms what we thought they ought to be doing and of course they know what they ought to be doing and they'd say well where is the route to market it's all very well for us to change our system but how are we going to sell whatever it is that we produce particularly if it comes at a slight premium and so Hobmadod really existed for human consumption products in order to create a route to market and create a sort of transparent network of supply that allowed customers and farmers and retailers and chefs to all come together and understand how food was produced. And I think we could replicate that very similar transparent model for, for feed production as well, by bringing people together and creating routes to market, uh, not just for the feed products themselves, but for the eggs, dairy and livestock that might be produced as a, as, a, as a product of that to explain to people what these soy free systems look like, whether there, there might need to be a premium and it's questionable as to whether there would need to be a premium now because of what is happening to the price of soya and scarcity in that in that protein market. So there is a real window of opportunity for some quite broad change and I suspect some of the big feed companies will get quite interested in that as well. Um, Jacob perhaps coming to you next on this.
Oh, you're on. You're on mute. Sorry, can you remind me the question, please? Well, it was talking about how we get more farmers doing this. What are the, you know, what are the barriers? What are the, what are the ways forward? Well, think, I suppose. Yeah, sorry. So the, the barriers, a lot of the barriers, are time, um, you know, processing birds, for example, even three hundred a week, is quite a lot of work involved in amongst doing all your other enterprises and and uh, and jobs. So, I think time is, you know. I work at ridiculous hours and um, trying to find some time to ha have off is often very difficult. And I think um, some of the barriers of all these ideas, which are great, but it's actually having the time to um, find out how to do it and the energy to deal with um, you know, government agencies and things as well. Um, Nick, Colour or, or Nick, any, any thoughts on, I don't know, particularly the barriers to change? I think um, lots of people are incredibly locked into their existing system and uh, it's very difficult for some people to get out because they are very heavily borrowed and they are on a treadmill and it's they're a bit like a gerbil <laughs> and you, how are they going to get off um, so um, uh, yeah I, I think lots of people would like to change but are, are locked in it's, it's it's what happens there I haven't got a clue No, um, uh, I, I think uh, just speaking really personally, uh, something that my brother and I were lucky to benefit from from day one is we, we are first generation and we started our farm, our business with a really food centric angle. And um, for many people that have been farming for generations, some of that food that it's not it's about producing tons of grain or tons of uh, pig meat etc it's not about producing uh, a, a beautiful end product that we can sell direct and obviously my model isn't going to work for everybody but I do think we really benefit from having that focus on the end product all the time. Yeah I, I, I completely agree particularly with a with a pasture for life hat on. Um, I think we've, we've got five minutes left. There was one other question that popped up a few times, which is somewhat um, detailed, perhaps in, in the sort of response it might need, but um, it, it kind of revolved around avian flu. And then someone was asking more broadly around uh, how you manage disease in these systems. So perhaps going to the, well, particularly to the kind of primarily poultry producers. So Jacob, perhaps first, um, how have you coped with this? So, um, so avian flu has been prevalent, well, as, as I'm sure it's always been prevalent, but it's certainly um, come up the last probably four or five years, every year, like clockwork, come the kind of the 6th of December, we can be pretty sure we're going to be put on lockdown. So, um, and I think this year in particular, it's even worse than previous years. So the way we've coped with it, we've reduced our stocking densities. Um, so when we have to lock them up, there's a lot more space in the sheds. Um, and uh, and that helps massively. Um, the though we want our birds free range, actually um, having them indoors during this period with less uh, with more space for them, um, it's a lot drier environment for them and and a lot warmer at this time. So that's helped substantially. And then with regards to disease and things, um, the moving of the sheds, fresh pasture. Um, letting the ground rest has a massive difference. If we move a, a, a batch of chickens onto grass, which hasn't been used for, um, you know, well, it's the first time you use it, we will struggle to keep the weight off them. They will just get really big. Um, so we know that the moving birds from pasture to pasture um, helps um, with, with disease. Um, we find um, if there's ever going to be an issue, it's always down to the brooding stage. Um, which generally is um, in the yard, um, and so it's keeping that spotlessly clean. If we if we can get the chick out healthy at uh, three four weeks old, then we pretty much don't have any issues out in the field. Um, so yeah, and it's stocking densities is the main is the main thing. As soon as you increase, it gives something space and um, air, and it will it will do well. 
Nicola, one, one minute. And if you could also possibly answer the question on how you might cope on steep ground if you're doing um, mobile chicken houses. Um, ooh, well, the, the, the eggmobile goes on relatively steep ground, but not crazily steep ground. It's got, um, it's an old caravan chassis, so we can kind of um, do what you do with caravans to keep them straight. Um, but yeah, very steep ground, it wouldn't work. Um, I forgot what the other question is. Oh, avian flu. Um, I, just like Jacob said, I think poultry in these systems is just generally much more healthier and robust against diseases. And I think if, if you go into industrial chicken shed, I keep going on about this, but they are breathing in fecal dust continually and, and, and our chickens aren't. So I think that makes a huge, huge difference. And it's, it's um it's just keeping animals the way they in in a, in a situation that they thrive in rather than pushing it to the limits really great thank you nicola um i'm going to wrap up now we've got two minutes to go um and i would just say thank you very much to the to the whole panel to nicola renison to josiah meldrum nick francis and jacob sykes for a really fascinating discussion if you want to find out more please go to Wover, where you can find all of us um, if you have any follow-up questions, although I'm sure we're going to be all pretty flat out over the next um, day and a half. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for joining us.